Let's, uh, let's go right ahead and introduce our first speaker for the day. It is a gentleman by the name of Rian Fanamava. I'm sure some of you know Rian. He talks on the sofa quite often. Um, he studied in Stellenbosch uh, before moving to Perth, where he completed the PhD. Do you know what that stands for? No. Okay. <laughs> I don't know either, actually. A post-human degree? Po uh, do, you, do, you know what, do you know what that stands for? Really? Particularly hard degree? I think that's it. <laughs> It's a couple of years, right? At least like a year, right? It's a really hard degree. Very hard. You have to study a lot. Painfully harrowing degree. Just, yeah. Let, yeah. So uh, then what, what? Then he came back to It's a fascinating story. I'll tell you, he actually spent six years working in Silicon Valley as well. He's also worked for eBay, which is pretty good. You guys know eBay, right? Silicon Valley, that's like a, that's the, that, it's, a, it's, an amusement, it's an amusement park. Oh, and, uh, I thought it was a plastic yeah, surgery. No, Silicon Valley, I think, has the highest roller coaster awesome. in the world. Is that, is that right? Yeah? Sure. You're not sure. I'm too busy studying. Pretty hard degree. Um, um, interestingly enough, you know that he, when he came back to South Africa, he actually started the popular internet phrase YOLO. Really? He did. No, he was behind that. I'm actually impressed that, that he actually made it back to South Africa because every single animal and everything in Australia is trying to kill you, so congratulations mm. for making it back. And oh, sorry, I've just seen that it's yola, yola.com, not yola, sorry about that. Oh, that's a little disappointing. Yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> if, there, if there are a lot of rugby jocks here today, I'm you're pretty disappointed by that, you know, could meet the guy starting the world favourite phrase. Uh, Ruan has also uh, headed up the product and user experience design teams at uh, Kalahari.com. Maybe we should ask them about that order yeah. that we put through. It hasn't been delivered yet, right? I don't know. We, we got some DVDs. The, I think it was the Aladdin, Disney. Yeah. The, the gold, the, the, the gold one. Right? I don't know if you could look into that for us, maybe. Um, it comes with the rug. It comes with the rug. It's pretty, pretty good. Still that. waiting for that. Still waiting, still waiting for that. But anyway, uh, thank you so much for tolerating us. Up here. We'll be back several times in between speakers to annoy you. But uh, for now, please welcome your first speaker of the day, Mr. Rian van Abadra. Thank guys, I'd love to take you with me in my pocket everywhere I go so that you can kind of introduce me to people because that uh, will clearly help a lot. So good morning everyone, it's a bit dark in here. Good morning everyone. It's really hard, usually I'm not on first, it's really hard to be on first so to the other speakers you owe me because it's really hard to figure out what the, what it, what the audience is going to be like during the day. So um, this is my, my first time doing the first talk so be gentle on that. It's also a different kind of talk. Uh, as you can see, I'm going to talk about how to build an audience in 743 difficult steps. Uh, I usually do UX and design talks, so this is a, I'm a little bit out of my comfort zone today, telling you uh, uh, stories about uh, what I do uh, when I'm not doing UX and design stuff. So, so it's, we'll see how that works. Um, what I'm doing currently is I'm a, um, a director at Flow. We're a UX design company. So we do a lot of uh, interaction design, graphic design, and front-end development for companies, do a lot of usability testing and things like that. Um, and on the side, I uh, write a site called Elysia. And um, to get the WordPress stuff out of the way, because I think that's what we're supposed to talk about, it is a WordPress site. Uh, it's a custom theme. Um, I never see the WordPress dashboard. I use a, an app called Mars Edit to publish. I don't know if there's anything else to say around that, because that's not really, uh, the, I'm, I'm sure um, that's not really the interesting part today. So if you think about the site that I write and what I write about, clearly the first step to creating an audience is to pick a URL that no one can pronounce. Um, that is definitely the biggest mistake I've ever made, is to, in the, in the search for a six-character URL, 
uh, pick something that no one wants to say because they have no idea if they're going to say it right. I think it's pronounced Elysia. I am actually not entirely sure because every time someone tells me, uh, they say it in a different way. So the first thing I want to say is if you want to build an audience, please pick a URL that people can pronounce because doing it this way is particularly difficult. Um, but uh, hopefully you can spell it now and, and go check it out at some point. Um, but that's also not what I really want to talk about. I want to back up a little and I really want to talk about writing today and about um, why I think it's important for us to do that and for, for everyone in this room to do that. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about the mistakes I've made and kind of the philosophy that I've come, come around to in terms of how to get people to write the stuff that you read, them, read the stuff that you write. Because uh, that's what, what, what we all want, whether we're writing personal blogs or, or uh, blogs for our companies or pro-blogging or whatever it is that we want to call it, we need people to write, to read those things. So the first question is, why do this? Why, particularly in the realm of personal blogging, why even do it? Uh, because it's, it's really hard work and people are mean on the internet and it's not always nice, so why should we actually do it? And for me, there were two reasons that got me started in this. Um, and why, why I keep at it even though I want to quit about once a week. The first thing is what's called the art of public thinking and this has been a really interesting process for me. It's the idea that um, since I work in technology and, and in design, um, you tend to get caught up in your own thoughts and it is when we start thinking about those things in public that those thoughts become real. Um, and that you start to think through what, you, what it is that you really believe and what it is that you really think and by thinking in public, you're able to solidify the things that you think about. Uh, Clive Thompson says this while, he says, the process of writing exposes your own ignorance and half baked assumptions. And that's happened a lot, where I start writing something where I think this is really awesome, and then never publish it because I realize that's actually a really crappy thought. And no one should read that, and I'm so glad there's a draft thing, and I can just throw this away. The idea of writing um, and the fact that if someone's going to read this, it better be able to stand up to criticism, I feel makes me a better designer. And I think whether you're in development or whatever it is that you do, writing about the stuff that you do is going to make you better at that thing. Because you're going to be able to communicate it better and you're also going to be able to test your own assumptions and expose your own ignorance um, uh, by doing that. And the second thing is that I really think a URL that you own and of where you live is the new resume. We can have Twitter profiles with a lot of followers or Google Plus or App.net or whatever it is that we're supposed to use, but those things might actually disappear. And then where is your resume then? Um, hopefully it's not going to be on. Well, LinkedIn, there's a lot of hate for LinkedIn right now, so I don't, I don't know how you guys feel about LinkedIn, but if that's your resume, maybe that's also um, not the right place for it to be. And why I like the idea of your own site and your own URL as, as, as a resume is no one can take that from you. Um, no one can shut that down, and like Everpix yesterday and your photos disappear. Um, no one can shut that down. If you, if you own your space online, that is where you can live, and that is where you can grow, and that is where you can show people who you are and what you think. Um, Nothing will impress more than an individual who has taken the time to craft and share their perspectives about either the industry that they serve or what inspires them. And I really think about this in terms of career as well, is that uh, we come out of an old school thinking, we've come out of our old school thinkings where we work for a company and that company owns us and we better be nice and do what they want us to do because they pay us our salary. Where I think of our work more as a platform, I'm not going to say the word personal branding, but I do think that our our work is a platform. Um, and by writing on our own platform, that becomes, uh, we grow in that, not just the place that we work at, uh, but also in the way that we communicate with people. So sharing what we know and sharing how we're thinking through things, not that we know everything, but sharing things in a way that exposes our own assumptions is not just great for us to become better at what we do, it's also great for us to become our legacy in a way, and to become our platform and become our work for uh, I work for a, for a certain time. So when I got these thoughts and I realized, okay, I obviously need an online resume and um, it's obviously important to do this because I need to start thinking in public, the first thing you go is, all right, let's go ahead and build an audience. Let's set up WordPress and start writing and people are going to come. And, and everyone in this room knows that's not how it works. So I started doing a lot of this. 
there's a whole lot of typing going on, and I'm like, yeah, this is awesome, I'm going to hit publish, everything's going to be great. Every once in a while I publish something and say, there we go, an interesting and thought-provoking post, I can't wait to see the responses, and then the responses come in and they're not particularly thoughtful. Um, which is why I don't have comments anymore, I'm not gonna, that we can talk about it later, but this is how it works. We write these things and we go, man, I worked a week on this post, and then someone comes along and tells you you're an idiot because you spelled something wrong, or, or uh, because you used a Star Trek reference where you were supposed to use a Star Wars, ref Star Wars reference. <laughs> and that can really, you know, not make you feel good about writing. So I started a lot of my days like this in the early days, where I would get up, before my kids get up, go online, delete all the F words from the comments, and then go through the day thinking, why do this? This is ridiculous. I really, really don't need this. So there has to be a different way, and, um, and I just don't want to do this anymore. So once a week I get to a point where I'm like, that's it, I'm not going to write anymore, I'm just going to do my own thing. Um, some of you might remember one of the biggest mistakes I've made three years ago is write a thing about Star Unicorn and Flash. Does anyone remember that? <laughs> Cool, okay, anyway, I wrote a thing about Star Kimikor and Flash, and anyway, it involved a coffee with someone to make up and delete the post and all that stuff. So you learn these things along the way, is that people are gonna get upset and maybe it's just not worth it. But what happens during that point is now you have a site and now you've published for a while and every once in a while you get a little bit of traffic. So you start to, the lure of the easy starts to get you and you go, well, there are ways to get traffic that aren't necessarily the right ways, but it's really about traffic. It's really about eyeballs. And I get all these emails in my inbox from people who want to, um, because they're such nice people, want to send me all this traffic. So let's start opening and reading this email. So you get things like, um, this is, has anyone got an email from Aldo Baker? I think he's been around for, for 10 years. I, mean, I, I think he just has a bot, I don't, he's not a real person. Um, I did spend way too much time researching Aldo Baker. If you go to aldobaker.me, you'll find a, a, an image of him, and then when you put that image into Google Image Search, you'll see that it's a stock photo. Okay, I said too much. Okay, I understand that I've spent way too much time trying to stalk this guy who doesn't want to stop emailing me. But in this particular case, he saw that I linked to a report that I've never ever linked to, but he has an infographic for me which fits perfectly. And all I have to do is put this infographic on the site, and all I ask is that you credit the source, I could send visitors to your site as a thank you if you would like. That sounds pretty awesome. Or this is probably the favorite email I've ever received. Uh, they want to buy custom links. I love this line, are you sell link ads at insert article? <laughs> <laughs> I think many of you probably get this a lot. It's like they just give up. They don't even, they don't even put in your site's name anymore. They just want to, they just, I saw this thing at Insert Article, would you like to buy links? <laughs> or this one, uh, this is a freelance content writer, I get these a lot. Uh, I would primarily be saying you pay content for publishing on your site. That sounds awesome, I can pay someone to, to write on my site, I guess, maybe that's good. So I get all these emails, people saying, I can sell you these things, or I can give you back links, and you know it's gonna work. It's, it's, and, and it's very hard to go through the process of starting a site and having zero traffic and then looking online and getting all these emails and going, I'm gonna stay away from that. That feels like it's not working right now. <laughs> Is it? Should I try a different microphone? This one? Okay, no, this one. All right, now I sound different. Use all three. Oh, now my sound trebly again. Okay, is this all right? Okay, we'll just keep going. So, and then before you know it, you start clicking on links that you know you should have clicked on. You know, it's like it's midnight and you see this link on Twitter and you go, I shouldn't click on this. It's not what you think though, it's links like this. How brands can use paid blogging to get their message out to the right audience, and then you start reading, and five seconds later, a pop up comes up. To just enter your name and email address and you will get a free report for the latest SEO traffic getting methods. Wow. <laughs> Sounds really awesome. I should probably do that. And before you know it, you're starting to think about making your site look a little bit like this. It's like, if I just put a couple more like buttons there, the traffic will come. Because that is what the internet tells me to do. 
if I just buy enough links, if I just have enough like buttons and tweet buttons, all my problems will be solved. And then in one of these things where I was uh, um, in the middle of the night in front of the screen clicking these things, reading these things, I just realized this is actually not what I should be doing. We have to stop. I don't want to do this anymore. But there has to be a different way. And what is that different way? And that's what I want to talk about. And the, the question that came up in this darkest hour of mine is why are we so unwilling to work hard for the things that we really want? Because I read all these things and I see all these things. I see, you see all this edge, edge rank stuff on Facebook where people create pages and then once it gets to a million likes, they sell it to someone else. Or now that Twitter has pictures and timelines, you see all the brands posting pictures, pictures with their links so that the pictures can, so you can take over more of people's timelines. It's that quote about the greatest minds of our generation is figuring out how to get people to click on more links. And it is, I, that sounds great, and it's probably great for traffic and all that stuff, but I didn't feel like I was going to be good for my soul. So I wanted to do it something a different way, and there was a phrase that I came upon that, that, that really stuck with me, and is still sticking with me as I try to build the site, and that is the long, hard, stupid way. The long, hard, stupid way, and that is how I try to build the site. The long, hard, stupid way. And this comes from um, a, t a TV show, one of those restaurant TV shows. It's a, a chef by the name of David Chang. And he said in one of his tirades to his people, just because we're a casual restaurant doesn't mean we don't hold ourselves to fine dining standards. We try to do things the right way, and that usually means doing things the long, hard, stupid way. That doesn't make any sense if you, f if you first think about it, but if you start to think about it a little more, you realize that it makes a lot of sense. Because think about your life and the things that you had to figure out for yourself when no one was there to help you. Think about the satisfaction that came from learning how to do that. Think about the satisfaction of doing something really hard and figuring it out and high-fiving yourself because you're so awesome and learned this thing. And think about all the other things that came along when you, when you started figuring that out, all the other things you started getting interested in. So what happens is if you do things the hard way, you get an endless cycle of growth, learning, and mastery. If you do things the hard way and don't think about the, the easy ways, you, start, you continuously grow and you continuously get better at what you do and you continuously find different things to be interested in and grow in. The easy way, all it does is teaches you how to play the part without substance or continued growth. So buying backlinks might get me a lot of traffic, but it won't help me understand what is good about that traffic, or who is behind that traffic, or what did I write to get those people there. I can get the traffic, but for how long before it becomes really, really empty? So what does that mean, you ask? It means that instead of this, we have to say, let's build an audience the long, hard, stupid way. And apologies for the Terminator reference. Is anyone old enough to remember the Terminator? A couple of you are old enough to remember the first Terminator. This is the best scene ever in movie history. No? OK, anyway, um, get Terminator 1 from the alternative circuit. And uh, just uh, this is really important for your uh, continued education. So basically, I want to share three lessons with you that I've, that I've learned over time about how to build an audience the long, hard, stupid way. The first lesson is that nobody wants to read your shit. And this is probably the most important thing that a writer will ever, ever realize, is that nobody wants to read the stuff that you write. Not even your dog or your mother has the slightest interest in your commercial for Rice Krispies or Delco batteries or Preparation H. Nor does anybody care about your one app play, your Facebook page, or your new sesame chicken joint at Canal and Chocodulusis, whatever that is. It isn't that people are mean or cruel, they're just busy. This is the most important thing any writer needs to realize, is people aren't mean or cruel, they're just busy, and they don't want to read the things that you write. And once you realize that, it's actually quite liberating, because you realize that what you're entering in it's not something where people are going to give you their time for free. You're entering into a transaction with someone. You're entering a, into a transaction with your readers. You have a reader, you have you, they have time and attention, and you have to give them something worthy to give up that time and attention. That is the only hard way and the real way to build a sustainable audience is for people to, to realize that nobody wants to read the stuff that we write, 
unless it is worthy enough for their time and attention. We're all, I tweeted this thing the other day about how we're all amateur uh, attention economists now. Because all this stuff comes at us and we can read something cool or look at 25 GIFs on BuzzFeed and usually the 25 GIFs on BuzzFeed is going to win. But is that really a good use of our time and attention? And for how cheap are we selling our time and attention? And do we have responsibility as content creators to do something different? And one of my favorite pieces of last year was Paul Ford who wrote a great article called 10 Time Frames where he said, if we are going to ask people in the form of our products, in the form of the things we make, to spend their heartbeats on us and our ideas, how can we be sure, far more sure than we are now, that they spend their heartbeats wisely? And that was the first thing that was important to me, is I have a responsibility, if I vomit things onto a page online, I better make sure that those things are worthy to be read. And I don't hit that mark every single time, but it's really important for me not to take the easy way out. I took the easy way out once, uh, um, and it, I accidentally got on Reddit, and it was just the worst experience ever, because once those people get on your side, poof, they, they are not very nice always. And so you get all the traffic, but you don't get the satisfaction that comes from interaction with people. So that's the first lesson. I'm really sorry, but no one wants to read the stuff that you write. No one wants to read the stuff that I write. Uh, and that's because people are just really busy. The second thing is, as we talk about this fact that the, it's a transaction between you and readers, and that you need to give something that's worthy, some things just aren't worthy. And I think headline writing has taken a turn for the worst over the past year. I mean, BuzzFeed really ruined a lot of things um, in the way that they write their headlines. There's so many to choose from, but my all-time least favorite headline in the world is this one from Upworthy. He's speaking, she's playing, and I'm just over here trying to pick my jaw up off the floor. I've watched this 13 times, and it's still giving me goosebumps. First of all, I'm pretty sure her jaw is still firmly attached to her face. Second of all, I don't think she really watched it 13 times and then it still gives her goosebumps. But this is the kind of thing that's going to get people to click on links, is this, these kinds of titles. All it is, obviously, is YouTube in bed, but they're pretty sure they got a lot more hits than the original YouTube video. Business Insider is really horrible at this as well, moving into the tech space. This is my favorite Business Insider thing of all time. Outraged blogger is automatically being followed by her abuse of ex-husband on Google Buzz. Remember Google Buzz? Those were good times. No? Okay. Anyway. And this is a picture of Eminem in a ski mask uh, bearing a, um, what appears to be a chainsaw. Why is Eminem in a chainsaw on here? Who knows? Because it's, I guess, an outraged blogger or abuse of ex-husband. So we get to this point where we algorithmic, algorithmically choose the best titles for our things just to get people to click on it. Yahoo tests more than 45,000 combinations of headlines and images every five minutes on its homepage. The best people, or the worst, depending on how you look at it, is this, is the Huffington Post. They are unbelievably good at doing this stuff. They do live testing on their titles. When a title goes live, for the first five minutes, they A-B test it in li live, and then switch the title to the one that gets the most clicks. They build all those algorithms in-house. So they get amazing results from that. This was, a, as an example, a, a thousand word uh, column in the Washington Post about Romney's tax confusion. It got 938 comments. Huffington Post took that, they wrote a 300 word summary of that, then they took 200 words out of the original article, but they changed the title to something much more sexy. Mitt Romney is squandering candidacy with healthcare tax snafu. Excellent SEO there, right? They get the they get the edge words there like snafu, but they get the Mitt Romney thing in there and healthcare. So really well done, and more than seven thousand comments. And a lot of tech sites do this. How many tech sites do we read? They just say according to TechCrunch, and then they summarize what those sites have said. And I understand that this is maybe good business, and if, if that works for people, I'm totally fine with that. I'm just trying to, to share my philosophy around this and why I think it's, um, it, it, didn't, it didn't work for me. So, once they are swallowed by the HuffPo's clever traffic generating machine, the same journalistic item will make tens or hundred times better traffic-wise. Why is this bad uh, is probably something that you're going to say. They're really good at this. They get all the traffic. That's really good. Well, I think as, a, as someone who, uh, as personal bloggers or people who blog for our companies or write for our companies, 
I'm not sure this is the right way to build a, a, a good audience and a sustainable audience. Because I think there's two elements missing from that. The first element is obsession. And this is really something that, that has been really close uh, to my heart and, and something that helped me figure out what I should write about. The first thing is, what am I obsessed about? What is the thing that my wife really wants me to shut up about every night? When you go to parties or go talk to people, what can you not shut up about? What is your obsession? And it could be really, really niche. It could be <clears throat> bloopers in Star Wars. I don't know if that's a thing, but maybe it is. Because the thing about what's great about the internet, no matter how weird your obsession is, there's going to be more people on the internet that shares your weird obsession. That's the great, the great thing about it. But obsession isn't enough. The th second thing is, what is your voice about this obsession? What is it that you can bring to this obsession that shows people how you really feel about it and that communicates your, uh, your perspective on it? And if you put those things together, if you take obsession times voice, you get something that's suddenly, I think, really worthy, no matter what that obsession is and no matter what that voice is. Because now you're suddenly in a space where you're talking about things that you really care about and you're talking about, a, about them in a way that only you can talk about it. And I love this quote from Callum uh, J. Hackett that says, this is why I prefer to follow people rather than topics. And I found myself doing this online as well. I'm following all the big accounts and following people that I find interesting whose voice I find interesting even if I don't agree with them because that is what adds value to my life. While I know what to expect 90% of the time, I look forward to that 10% which I never have predicted but which I still enjoy reading. And there are a lot of sites that do this and do this really well. This is one example, the Loop, uh, Jim Dalrymple, uh, loopinside.com, also a WordPress site. It writes mostly about Apple stuff, but also random YouTube videos about guitars and things, because he's, um, he's a guitarist. So 90% of the time I know I'm going to find Apple news on, on, loop, on the loop, but I also know this guy is interesting enough. I listen to his podcast. I'm following him. I'm interested in what Jim Dalrymple has to share. And sometimes that has nothing to do with Apple, but sometimes I find something that is really interesting that I didn't know I would be interested in. And The Loop is, a, is another example of a site that went through this cycle. It used to have ads all over the place. It used to do the whole uh, summarizing text stories thing and getting all the links. And at some point, he just went, enough with that. I'm going to clean up my design. I'm going to run one ad. And I'm going to write about the things that I care about. And he still does this full time um, through, through subscribers and advertising. Um, and he, he's doing it in this way. He's found his obsession and his voice. So there are lots of examples of people out there, John Gruber is another one, um, that, uh, that follow this thing. So that's the second lesson I learned, is find the obsession and find the voice. And the third thing I learned is that writing is one thing, but publishing is a whole different thing. And what I mean by that is, I talk to so many people who say, yeah, I'm still working on setting up my blog. I've, I have about six months of content, and once I have nine months, I'm going to start publishing those. That is not how it works. It's really easy to write things for yourself. It's really hard to do the publishing thing. So we are really scared sometimes to go, if I publish this thing, people are going to read it, and I'm probably going to be wrong. Yes, you are, I'm pro and that's OK. I think we're really scared to, to, to sometimes click that publish button. But I think without clicking that publish button, we're not going to get better at what we're doing. So my third lesson was, lesson was to, even when I think something isn't perfect, to publish anyway because it's the only way you're going to get better at it. And just because I doesn't have, don't have comments doesn't mean I don't get feedback. I get a lot of uh, emails about how I'm wrong about things or tweets about how I'm wrong about things and that helps me get better the next time I write things or I get to add links to the stuff that I write or I get to write, sorry I was wrong, um, which isn't as bad as it sounds because it is, it is me thinking in public um, and publishing and getting better at it because other people are joining in on that. And the big quote here for me is, there's no avoiding the deliberate strain of real improvement. And that's basically the thread that runs through, through this whole thing for me, is the long, hard, stupid way is not easy. Um, but if you want to get, really get better at what you do, there's no avoiding that deliberate strain. There's no avoiding the hardness of it. And, and the months with no traffic that comes along with that until you find your obsession and voice. 
So you may ask, okay, so how's that working out for you? And, I, and this is the hard part because I'm not sure what you want me to share, what I, what I should share and shouldn't share. So all I say is that the page views are slowly going up and to the right. But, you know, slowly, but it is slow growth. But there's actually something that I found out in, in doing this. Who your readers are, are actually more important than how many readers you have. Because when I started getting approached to write in different places and to um, get uh, um, sponsorships, the first discussion wasn't about my number of RSS subscribers or the traffic. The first discussion was, we've seen your stuff over here, those are the people we want to talk to. It wasn't how many clicks am I going to get through this ad, it's you're talking to the people that we want to talk to. So the first thing that happened was writing in different places, writing in, in a list apart, writing in Smashing Magazine, getting to now write a book for Smashing Magazine, those are all paid gigs that came from writing on my own site. Not, not that I approached them, those are things that they approached me about. I also have two main things on the site uh, that bring in uh, revenue. The first one is I'm part of an RSS ad network called The Syndicate, which sounds really creepy if you think about it, but uh, it's a bunch of sites that run a weekly RSS sponsored, sponsored post. Um, and again, this was really surprising to me because we, we, um, they approached me and they said, Can, let's do a test post and see how it goes. And I was petrified. I was like, I'm going to read this, t this, this I'm going to publish this post, they're going to get no clicks from it, and it's going to be really awkward because then they're just going to kind of go away. But that's not what happened really. I even said, look, I don't know if this is enough clicks, and they said to me that is not what this is about. The cynic is about reaching a specific type of audience that you have access to, and we want to be part of that. And then I've never wanted to have a bunch of ads on the site, but I've always liked this model that the deck uses where you have one small ad that's contextual to the, to the stuff that you write. So I'm also part of uh, um, adpacks.com. There's a bunch of different ad packs, so I'm part of the user experience ad pack. They, they place one um, graphical ad on the site um, that, uh, that is related, related to impressions, not even, also not on clicks. But these are all things that I didn't ask for, uh, that, I, I, that I hoped to one day happen, but it only started happening when I started doing these other things, when I didn't write the easy articles, when I started doing a, talking about my obsession and trying to find the voice that's in there. But perhaps I think most importantly for me is, uh, you can't see this, but these are the types of emails that keep me going, where people say, I've been reading this for a long time and I really like it, and then he says, I always read it in my RSS reader, so I'm not even tracked as a visit to your site. So you have these people who are even cognizant of the fact that traffic is important to the world, and he just wants to let me know, even though I don't track him, he's a reader in RSS. And this is the thing that every week when I get an email like this, I go, let me, let me just go one more week, <laughs> this one more week, um, and not give up yet. Because it is really hard work when the growth is so slow, and when, you, when you're not sure if it's actually ever going to go anywhere. So for me, the things that I, that I learned, and this might not work for you, but I really just wanted to share kind of how uh, my story and how I, I came to write the way I do, is I think it's important to find your obsession. I think it's important to find your voice. I think it's important to publish more, not just write. Don't, don't, don't have a bunch of drafts, but actually start publishing those drafts, even if they aren't great. Getting feedback on those things are going to make it better. And, if you will, try to do it the long, hard, stupid way. Because you're going to get so much growth, personal growth out of that, and you're going to be much happier doing it. The danger of creating a path instead of following one is far more important than the feeling you get resting at the apex. And that's something that I feel is really important, is that, that deliberate strain, that trying to create a new path that doesn't exist, trying to ignore the links that you shouldn't click at midnight, has been difficult, but it also makes me, uh, gives me a real joy in, in doing the site that I do and knowing that I have a real community of people who read it and share it and enjoy it. And it's going to make you happy, that's maybe the most important thing of it all. It's like, uh, by, by writing in this way and by doing things this way, I think you'll sleep better at night and you'll enjoy it more because if you stop worrying about the number of page views and start worrying about what is the type of person I want to talk to, uh, that's going to be a lot more fulfilling for many of us. And I think I'm in five minutes, so perfect. We have, uh, if there are questions, there we can do that. And thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Hello. Cool.
All right, thanks, Ryan. Um, only counted about 715 steps there, but Sorry. Yeah, we can chat afterwards. Yeah. So, uh, any questions for Ryan? Any questions? Cool. Cool, thanks, Ryan. <laughs> Legend. Well, yeah, round of applause, please.